where you've been, what you've done, and what you have done to you. You are the promise of the journey that God knew you were going to Last week, I didn't get to where I, I planned on getting to last week, but we're going to get to it today. We're in this series called We Are Church. And last week and the last few weeks, we've been in John chapter 14, verse 2, right, where it says, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you. And the last few weeks, we've been breaking down the scripture, talking about church. And that a lot of times we read this scripture, and what we read is God is, 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 a, is a construction worker, and he's building mansions for me great big houses, rich houses for me in heaven. And then Jesus went up to heaven to prepare those places to build it. And then he's going to come down. And then one day when I die or when he comes to get me, I'm going to go back up to heaven and Peter is going to show me my mansion. But this passage doesn't mean that at all. In fact, Jesus doesn't say this as he's about to go to heaven. He says this as he's about to go to the cross. And breaking it down, you realize that what we read in English isn't always what is written in the original language. And that Jesus was actually saying, in me, I am the temple of God. I'm the temple. He says, break down this temple and I will raise it up in three days. The Pharisees said, how how can you do that? They didn't realize that he was talking about his body. That's what John 2 says. The real temple was never the building in the middle of Jerusalem. Jesus is the temple and he says in me in this temple there's not just three rooms there are many many rooms there's many dwelling places in me there is an entire kingdom of building there's a place for all of you but I'm going to the cross Not because I'm preparing a place for all of you, but because I'm marking off a place for you. Each and every one of you has a place in him. He went to the cross and created a place for you. He went to the cross so that he could take your house, clean out everything that's on the inside, Then he came back from the dead, looked at his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, now, you can be a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. He lives in you. So I want you all to turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And this is where we're going to jump off today. I don't know how far we're going to get into this. I'm trying to make it through this whole section today. So I want you to put on your ears. I want you to get ready with your pens to write some stuff down. Open up your hearts. And if we could go ahead and get one of those smaller desk tables and bring them right here, please. Thank you so much. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting with verse 1, it says, And I, brothers, this is Paul speaking, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal, as babes in Christ. Now, I want you to understand things. We tend to look at babes, and when we're talking about babies, you're talking about immature things. Now, babies aren't bad things. Nobody ever looks at a baby and goes, that's a bad thing. Babies are good things. Babies are beautiful. Every single one of you started off as a baby. It's okay. That's a starting point. He says, I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able, for you are still carnal. There's that word again. For where there are, listen to this, envy, strife, and divisions among you. Are you not carnal? Notice he doesn't say for where there are lusts and there are addictions and there are struggles, you are carnal. Listen to what he said. Where there is envy, strife, and division among you, you are carnal. And behaving like mere men. For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul? Who then is Apollos? But ministers through whom you have believed as the Lord gave to each one. I planted 
Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. See, there's sometimes there's, there's things in God's kingdom that look like they oppose each other, but if you'll stop trying to judge each season independently of itself and compare it to every other season and start say, stop saying that season was better than this season, I want to go back to that season, just like the Israelites did comparing the wilderness to Egypt. They decided, oh, I want to go back to Egypt. You would realize that each season builds upon the one before it. And it's part of a greater process God is doing in you. Stop desiring the things that you left because you're in the middle of the process. Paul said, it looks like I got my ministry. Apollos has his ministry. And Apollos was known to be great of words. He was a great preacher. Paul was not necessarily known as a great preacher. And people would look and go, oh, well, I like Apollos better. He preaches better. So I'd say, well, I like Paul. Paul is a brilliant theologian. He's a brilliant teacher. He's a missionary. And Paul says, man, you are just being carnal. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one. And each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. That means every person is accountable to what he or she does in Christ. But in the end, we are all laborers in the same field. There's no such thing as my church or your church. My church is better than your church. My pastor is better than your pastor. There's no such thing as that. We are all laborers in the same field. And the fact of the matter is, if we are going to reach this world with the gospel of Jesus Christ, we've got to lose this individual me, myself, and I mentality. And we've got to start realizing we all need each other. I don't want nobody coming to God's house and then going out and telling everybody else God's house is better than every other church on Maui. I don't want to hear that. Because we are all one. Verse 9, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. I want you to hear this, and this is a lot of scripture I'm reading to you. And I'm not, I, you can break down every single one of these and really spend a lot of time in it. But I want to give you a larger context for what he's saying, because I have a point here. So I don't want to get caught up too much in it. But I want you to hear how Paul's language, he sees his fellow believers and fellow ministers. He sees them as partners in this singular thing we are building. So he speaks to the fact that we are all part of a greater whole. Yet, within the responsibility that we have as part of a greater whole, there's also an individual responsibility for what I do with the part God has given me. Verse 11, For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it is revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved as through fire. Do you not know? Here we go. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will
God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy. Which temple you are? Holy Spirit, just be with us today, God, and just speak. Thank you for your presence here. Father, I pray that you would give us a revelation of who we are as your temple, as one, undefilable, and what that means not only for your corporate body, for us, us as individuals. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. And I want to tie something together for you today. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. It says, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. In other words, in Christ, even though he set me free and given me liberty for everything, that doesn't mean I should do everything. If your wife says, I love you so much that even if you cheated on me, I would never divorce you. She, that might mean, and she might mean, that I'll forgive you no matter what you do. But her saying that I love you so much that I'll forgive you anything doesn't mean that you should then go out and go cheat on her. What I can do and what I should do are two completely different things. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Foods for the stomach and stomachs for the food, but God will destroy both it and them. This is a common, this is a common saying in those days. Food for the stomach and stomach for the food. In other words, I eat whatever I want to eat. Because my stomach was made for food. And food was made for my stomach. So I can eat whatever I want, consume whatever I want. But those things are both fleshly things. And in the end, they will both be destroyed. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you. And what's so significant about that is that he's not a life force. He's not a, a, a power stream. He is literally God living in you. And the spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead, that same power that death, hell, and the grave could not hold, that same power that came down, took the keys of everything Satan had, took everything back that he owned, and pulled it back so that you can have it all, lives in you. I thought you guys might be happier about that. <laughs> Do you not know? Listen to this language. He just said this in chapter 3. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot or a prostitute? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh, but he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Whom you have from God, and you are not your own. For you were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body, and in your spirit, which are God's. So here, within three chapters of one another, Paul talks about the temple of the Holy Spirit. He says, you are the temple of God, talking about two separate issues. And the first one in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he's talking about the greater body of Christ. 
You are all, we are all the temple of the Holy Spirit. All of us together, we are individual bricks in the building of the temple of the Holy Spirit. Each one of us is part of a greater whole. Not any one of us is alone unto ourselves. There's no such thing as doing your Christianity by yourself. There's no such thing as I don't belong to any part of the body of Christ. I just go out in a field and that's my church. That's not church. That's just you and God. God never meant for us to be loners in the body of Christ. If you ever watch a herd and you ever watch those National Geographic shows about, about lions and cheetahs and stuff like that and how they hunt, you'll notice they lie in wait on the outside of the herd and they never attack the herd. They wait for one animal that keeps itself in isolation and whether it's immature, sick, or isolated, it, 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 it stays away from the herd and it singles that one out. Some of us open up ourselves for invitation to be attacked by the enemy just by the fact that we won't ever get with none of the believers. And he snatches you up. We are all the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so Paul says, there are some of you who are like babies. You act like babies. You're little children. And you're carnal. And when I hear people talk about babies in Christ, we tend to talk about people who are just saved, new believers, young believers. Which is an easy correlation because they're newly born in Christ. But Paul here doesn't put an age or a time limit to who's a baby. He says, in the kingdom of God, he does not judge man by physical appearance or by man's time or by man's criteria. But God has a whole different criteria for how he looks at immaturity and maturity in the kingdom. So he says, I'm going to give you a clue as to what makes you immature in the kingdom. You are carnal. Now this word carnal is the word sarkikos. And sarkikos means having the nature of the flesh under the control of animal appetites. Governed by mere human nature, not by the Spirit of God. Pertaining to the flesh. He says you're carnal if you are ruled by fleshly desires. Now we look at that and go, oh yeah, I know what you're talking about, lust. Addiction, anger, loneliness, depression. Oh, yeah, Paul, we know what you're talking about. Animal, I'm ruled by my flesh. But Paul said, no, let me tell you what it is. Envy, strife, and division. Those are babies in Christ. When Jesus sat in that upper room and he knew he was about to die, and you, you read John chapter 14 through 17, where Jesus is sitting with his best friends hours before he was going to go to the cross, he knew he was going to die. His disciples didn't. Jesus knew something they didn't know, and he knew what they were about to witness was going to be potentially so devastating to watch the one that they called Messiah, that they said, you're my only hope. I have left everything for you. To see the loss of that thing could devastate you so bad. He had to tell them something to get them through the next three days. He said, if I can just get you through the next three days, hey, I'm going to leave you. You're going to see me die. You're going to see me torture. You're going to see everything that could shatter your faith. But if you can just make it through three days, I'm going to get up, and you'll never have to worry about that again. This is what he tells them. Listen to this. You've got to get through the next three days. I've got to tell you something. No matter what I tell you, is going to fully prepare you for what's about to happen, the cross, the torture, the whipping, all of that. This is what he says. I want you to be one, just as I and my Father are one. I in you, you in me. I want you to do this together. I'll take it a step further. If you are on your deathbed, you know you're spending your last moments with the people you love before you die. You don't talk about 
menial things. You don't say, how's the weather? When you know you're about to die, you tell the people that you love the most important things. The things that are closest to your heart. And Jesus reveals to his best friends, his disciples, the things that are closest to his heart. And it's all about unity. Being one. And so Jesus goes to the cross and he makes us one with the Father. Everything Jesus did was to bring reconciliation between God and man to make us one. So Jesus says, it is better that I go away and that I send the Holy Spirit to you because the Spirit of Christ Jesus will live inside of each and every one of you and make us one. And this church, this thing that is going to be so united and so powerful that hell itself cannot prevail against it. Jesus goes up to heaven and I feel like 2,000 years later, all of us believers, we never left the Mount of Olives. We're still looking up. When are you coming back? As soon as he goes up, the angel says, don't stand here looking. Don't stand here looking. In other words, go. Stop gawking at the sky. He's going to come back when it's time. But the Holy Spirit is coming, and the Holy Spirit is God. He's not lesser God. You're not settling for nothing. He's God. Just like Jesus is God. And Jesus said, go to Jerusalem and wait for him. And so they go. But over 2,000 years, this is what I've noticed and I've realized. The one thing Jesus wanted us to be, which is one body in him, the enemy has used envy, strife, and division to fracture his body into an almost unrecognizable state. Start off with Catholic, Protestant, and then they became Baptist, Methodist, Lutheran, Episcopal, Pentecostal, First Assembly, Second Assemblies, Fourteenth Assemblies. We no longer identify ourselves as believers in Jesus Christ. We identify ourselves according to a doctrinal or denominational leaning. And some of us will not leave our, den our denominational leaning and our doctrinal leaning even when the word of God contradicts it. It is in us to desire that division. Because it's in us, because of the fruit that Adam and Eve ate, to want to be right. And we will lean on our own understanding. And when anyone else's understanding differs from ours, we start to pick sides. And when we do that, Paul says, you are immature. You're carnal. And then later on, Paul is talking to people, and he's, in, in 1 Corinthians, in these letters, he's not necessarily writing doctrine. He's not trying to teach you a doctrinal, a universal system of theology. He's, he's addressing specific issues. And there's a danger, if we don't understand context, that we will take things that he's talking to, specific issues, and we'll apply it across everyone. And make it the rule of thumb. But in this case, what we need to do in these, in, these, uh, in these letters is we need to know the context of what he's talking about, what he's addressing. And pull out the universal principle inside of that thing that applies to us all. So the city of Corinth had, has what's called an acro-Corinth, right? And, and what it was is it was a, it was a part of the city that was like a citadel up on the mountain against which Corinth was built. And it was beautiful. It was a lookout. You could use it as a lookout. But on this Acro-Corinth, Corinth, like most other cities in 
the known world at that time had temples to their gods, just like Jerusalem had a temple to our God. And here, the God, because Greek, you know, Greek, the, the Greek religion, they had many gods, right? Zeus, Hermes, Hera, all of those, right? Athena, you know all of those, right? And here in Corinth, they had a god too. This one happened to be a goddess, and her name was Aphrodite, and she was the god of love. Love. She was the goddess of love. Aphrodite, they had a huge, beautiful temple up above the city. And this temple, because it was the goddess of love, they elevated as a form of worship sex. And they had a thousand temple prostitutes. And you would come to worship by having sex in these temples. This was the life that you lived. This was the worship that you knew. Sex was a god. They lived in a city where sexual immorality is not just accepted. It is a form of worship. And so these people would come to Christ. Men would come to Christ. Come to know the Lord. But they would hold on to the sexual immorality. And they would go and say, no, I'm just turning this as worship to God now. And still go to the temple of Aphrodite, still sleep with temple prostitutes, but say, I'm doing it as unto God now. And I want to draw a little bit of a parallel because I started looking and started thinking because out of all things that he could bring up, the fact that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, he chooses this one to talk about the destruction that can happen to yourself as the temple of God. And he says not only is the greater body of Christ together the temple of God, but you individually, not just you, your body, your body your body, your flesh and blood, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and he gave it to you. So I looked and I said, God, what is it about sex that is so important? Here's what it is. Here's what it is. You are made up of three components. You're made up of what? Spirit, soul, and what? You're made up of three parts, spirit, soul, and body. When Adam and Eve ate the fruit, something died in them. Spirit. Now, the thing about it is, soul wants to be in charge. The thing is, soul was never designed to be in charge. Soul was designed to be a slave. Soul was designed to be a servant. Soul was always designed to be servant to spirit, the spirit of God specifically. But when that was cut off, now soul, your mind, your will, your emotions, he's not designed to be in control of himself. So you know what he does? He looks for another master. With the absence of this master, guess who he finds? And soul is born... Listen to this guy. Now, but the problem with this guy is this guy is also slave. This guy is slave to something called. So soul becomes slave to sin. And you're all born with sin. But when you come to know Christ, all of a sudden, the spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead resurrects the real you, 
who you were always designed to be, and you are born again. And then he says, you are no longer slave to this guy, and this guy, now you're slave to this guy. See, liberty is not about you being in charge. You don't come to Christ and get to live your own way and do what you want. No, 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 no. The Bible says I was slave to sin, but now I'm slave to righteousness. You're going to serve one person or another. You're going to serve one thing or the other. And if you come to know Christ, but you still rebel against his authority, then you're still just slave to sin. So God creates man and woman, and he says, when you become man and woman, you become one flesh. How does that happen, right? It's not the piece of paper in the ceremony that makes you one flesh. That union is through sex. I can tell from some of your faces, you're really uncomfortable with me talking about sex right now. Some of you really wish I wouldn't say that word, sex. I know. I know. I know some of you guys watch Real Housewives and Kardashians, man. I'm just saying. Some of you have listened to much worse words on the radio this week. Two things the whole world is looking for is money and sex. Two things the church is so scared to talk about, money and sex. And we wonder why the whole world is following the enemy's version instead of God's. So, sex is the act that brings you in union. But he says, I don't want you to do that outside of marriage because when you become one flesh, you become joined in spirit. So sex in marriage is not about the body. Sex in marriage is about coming into oneness in spirit. My wife and I, we're, we're, we're one flesh. And so we're acting out with our body the covenant that is made in our spirit. Is everybody with me? And that you've confirmed with your soul, where you confirm with your mind, your own emotion. It says, I choose you above anybody else. I can marry anybody else, but I'm going to do life with you, and I'm with you, and I'm in covenant with you forever. But then what happens is, what sexual immorality does is, before you ever make the covenant, you decide to make the union. And now, you become one flesh with something. And you create a soul tie. Now, a soul tie is not really a soul tie. You either have a spirit tie through marriage or you have a flesh tie. But your soul, the reason why it's called a soul tie is because your soul is going to be slave. He's just, he doesn't know how to be master. He's just slave. So you create a slow tie. And then now that person, you're tied with them. And now even though in your spirit you know you shouldn't be with this person, you should break up with them and you need to leave them, guess what? You can't because you're tied. And you struggle every day with it. You know you need to leave them. You know you need to kick them to the curb. You know that he's driving you away from Christ. But you just can't do it because you tied it up here. And here he's talking. He's like, you belong to him. You're a slave to him. You're the temple for him. But you're going off, and then you're, you're becoming a temple of this. And now you are no longer unified with Christ. You are now divided. And remember he said you're the temple of the Spirit. Envy, strife, and division breaks the temple of God. And here you are. You have created a division in yourself. You're at one point one with Christ, but then you're at another point one with someone else who's not your wife or your husband. Now you're tied across two worlds. And he says, don't you know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? But now you've created a division and you're double-minded. And division, if you break it down, die means two.
All division is is two visions. You know why church splits happen? You know why church splits happen? Because you have a leadership in a church and they have a vision. But somebody comes in and they go, I'm not going to go along with that vision. I have my own vision for what I'm going to do. And then they start spreading that vision to other people and go, don't listen to that, that vision that they have. They're not of God. They start undermining that authority in Christ. And they start spreading their vision and what they want. And, what they, and you get sucked into it, right? They pick them off and they do that. And then all of a sudden, now instead of one vision in the church, unified together, now instead of one mind, one accord, one spirit, one, you know what we have? We have envy. We have division. We have strife. And all of a sudden, instead of one vision, now you can hear in the whispers of the secrecy, you hear two visions. And now all of a sudden, you have die vision. I need four men, four men who are going to volunteer. Get ready. If you volunteer, get ready. This is going to get a little bit crazy, but I need four volunteers. I like how Dallas wasn't going to volunteer until I said, be careful about volunteering. It's going to get crazy. He jumped up. All right. So I want you to stand here. Two. I just put up the one cup right now. Like, you fill them both up but we're only going to use one cup right now. Okay, now, I want you guys to turn around and face that way. And I need a couple volunteers. <laughs> Who's volunteering? Wow, this is kind of scary. Okay, yeah, we can just put that on the table. Now, wow, they don't even know what they're volunteering for. All right, if you want to help, you can. You want to help? It's going to be fun. If you're volunteering for this one, it's going to be fun. All right, I need some teenage girls. Let's get some teenage girls. Two right there, two right there. Okay, we got four of them right here. All right, so one of you in front of each one of these guys, and we're going to help them prepare, okay? So it is flesh, not Satan, flesh. Okay, I need your attention this way for a second. <laughs> I know, it's so much more interesting what's about to happen here. So we have flesh, flesh, not Satan, flesh is the greatest threat to the church as the temple of God. All right, this is what you guys are going to do. Okay, you guys got a hand? Okay, you guys are going to stand in front of each one of these, and you're going to help apply this <laughs> to each one of them. Get it on real good. We need it on really good. Oh, no. <laughs> we, need it, we need it nice and, and, and thick. flesh. That's why it's important that we understand grace, because grace is not a license to sin. Grace is a license to overcome sin. Grace is not a license for you to keep living divided, but he wants to make you one with him. <laughs> I know, you can't, this is going to get so good. <laughs> make sure we get a nice close-up on video and Nice to say, pucker them lips. Pucker them night. We got to get good coverage here. Nice, good coverage. We got to get good coverage. Good coverage. You guys look beautiful in the Holy Ghost. Now, Now, it's, it's fitting he calls it. You're not just a building. You're a temple. Temples are places of worship. They're places built for habitation, not by people, but by God. And whatever you worship is what you become a temple to. You become a temple to whatever it is you worship. And whatever you worship becomes your God. 
It's not what religion you belong to. It's not where you go on Sunday. Whatever you worship becomes your God. And you become a temple to whatever it is you worship. So what this does is sin causes you to worship the desires of the flesh. You become carnal. And a temple that is meant for God Because it becomes a temple to other things. We have, a, we have an issue in America that I want to address this morning. That has infiltrated our church and we've become okay with it. And it's called sexual immorality. I'm going to talk about it right now. It has become okay for us to objectify. and to allow sexual immorality to become a part of the culture of what it is to be a believer. More and more every day, and it's become very relevant to me because three of my daughters are in that, are, are at that teenage age, that we have become divided as the temple of God. And we are just as sexually immoral as believers as the world is. This is truth. I'm talking truth right now. Believers shacking up. Don't see nothing wrong with it. And Paul's looking going, you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. So this is what happens. You're this cup. God made you. You're beautiful. You're pure. And this water represents you. This is how you start. Clear. This cup, clear. No blemishes. No, nothing on it. And sex is tied to identity. It's tied to who you are. Because sex was meant to be a covenant that you give to someone else in which you symbolically give yourself to another person. It's the only thing like it. It is the one physical act you can make that is designed to represent the whole of you to give to someone else. That's why it is so private. That's why it is so valuable. That is why it's so intimate. And that's why it can't be just an act. It is you that you are giving to someone else at the most intimate level you can do it. So this is you. And what happens is, is when we don't find our identity in Christ, we don't fully understand identity. We don't really understand what we're giving away. So we try to find it in another person, and we go, I'm incomplete. But because sex makes me one flesh with somebody, I think that by becoming one with that person, that person will complete me. Because I have this inadequacy in my life and something inside of me just knows that sex will bring me in oneness and I think that oneness can make me complete. And so here comes person number one and you're like, man, I feel I'm just lonely. I just, you look beautiful by the way. You look, you look gorgeous. You got, I think you got away with one of the better shades. Comes along and you go, Here you are, and you go, 
Man, he makes me feel good. He makes me feel nice. Makes me feel beautiful. My dad, my mom, they're always, they're always, they're always telling me that I got to do this. I gotta, I'm not good enough and everything. And my dad didn't love me, and he left and doesn't spend time with me, but he really loves me. He, he's, he completes me. So you give yourself to him. Go ahead, drink. Drink a lot. Drink about a fourth of it. I mean, don't, don't leave back like that. You got to drink more than that. There we go. He's a drummer. He's thirsty. All right. And then you're like, this guy, I'm going to be with him forever. Yeah. I love him. And then he's not who he thought, you thought he was. And he leaves. And then here you are, and there's still you, but now there's less of you because you became one flesh with him, and then when he left your life, a part of you left too. And not only did he leave you, but he, he left a part of him imprinted on you. He stained you. He stained you. So you're like, what am I going to do? I have this stain on me. And there's less of me. I feel even more incomplete than I started. I feel more broken. I feel, I feel dirty. So the next one comes along. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's dirty, man. That's dirty. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh I'm never washing my face again <laughs> alright so the next guy comes along and you go no I don't want to fall in this trap again but he doesn't see me for this he sees me for who I, for who I am but you know what he's thinking because you know what guys without Jesus are thinking? They're thinking about sex. And they're like, oh, look. She gave it to the guy before. She'll probably give it to me. I'm being so real right now. You don't even understand how real I am. Some of you are so not comfortable with me being this real with you right now. So, hmm. I might not have to even really date her. Just tell her she looks pretty. Just help her around the house some. She's single. And you're trying to fill this thing that is even emptier than it started. So you think, man, maybe he'll give me some of his water. So you let him drink. But this guy, he got what he wanted from you. And he was never really about you. It was about what he could get from you. And now he's done with you, so he leaves. And now here you are. There's still you, but there's less of you because you gave a part of yourself to him. And now he left a part of himself and printed on you. Now you're really feeling bummed. And Jesus says, come to me. I'll make you new. I'll, I'll fill this. I'll fill every part of you. But we go, no, Jesus, you wouldn't want me. Look at me. I'm used up. Look. There's got to be another guy out there. There's got to be another person. This, for guys, this, this, this is the same when it comes to women. And you. So then another guy comes along. No, show it off, show it off. Oh, pink. I love it. Pink. Wow. <laughs> and, and now you're not even asking questions anymore. You think this is all you're good for. 
you think this is the only way a man will love you? Yeah, just drink. Huh? Yeah, just drink a lot. Just. And then that relationship doesn't work either. There's no covenant in this. It's just broken people breaking you. See, some of you, this is exactly how you feel right now. This is what you feel like. And then you know how it goes. You're in a cycle. Here comes another one. You can drink the whole thing. Thank you. You guys can sit down. We have baby wipes for you guys. For so many of you, this is who you are. And the temple that God meant to be pure is dirty, smudged up. And some of you feel just like this glass. And I want to talk to some young ladies in here. Because some of you feel exactly like this glass. Used up. There's nothing left to you. You carry the residue and the mark of relationships. And you feel completely empty. And we talk about godly relationships and about how God wants to love you and how there's somebody out there for you, but you don't even think you deserve it anymore. And you go, even if God brought me that kind of person, what do I have to give? But see, it's a lie that the enemy tells you because I was born in trespass and sin. So the truth is, when I was born, I looked like this. I was never what I thought I was. I always needed him. And all of a sudden, what was meant to be the temple of the Holy Spirit can no longer have, inhabit God. See, a temple is consecrated. It's set apart for that God. Everything that's in there is for the purpose of that God. And your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, you can't unwind the clock. You can't go back to the past. And I debated if I was going to go this, this far with it because I knew it would probably take us pretty long today. But I felt like there were some specific people that God wanted to speak to today. Because you want to know what God does? The Bible says if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature, right? So that means no matter what my sin was, no matter what it was, sexual immorality included, I was this. But see, what God wants to do, in fact, if you'll bring me some water, just, we still have a water bottle? Just one. Okay. Or just, I'll take that cup. This is what we think God is going to do. We come to Christ, and we think what God does is that God goes, don't worry. I'll refill your cup. And some of us, this is your relationship with him. You feel like you're filled and God has filled you back with his purity, but you're still in the same cup. You still feel dirty. But this is what God does. God doesn't just fill you with his spirit.
changes the cup. God is raising up a generation who says, I want to be the temple, the inhabitation of God's presence. And I want to be pure before him. To make purity my priority. To say I belong to him. No more addictions. No more immorality. I will not give myself to another man or woman that is not my husband or my wife. Forget the past. Forget all of that. We start fresh. I want you to stand up with me. Where you've been, what you've done, and what you have done to you. You are the part of the journey that God knew you were going to be.